Well, well. And of course, every time you hear that, you know, another scientific validation and vindication is coming higher truth's way. I ran across this article, and back when we were warning you that the excess helium was creating excess energy and and radiation, back when we were warning you that the excess helium was a sign that a brown dwarf could be nearby, the, the lithium was a sure giveaway, but of course nobody's talking about the lithium because that's, that's like an, an exact ID. But the, this article talks about the evidence for a distinctive change in the solar wind helium abundance. This article talks about alpha particles especially. And it talks, if you see the very last the very last line is cut off, but it says the frequency of AHE, that's the uh, a ratio of helium, um, is two to three times greater, okay, than the, all previous solar cycles. They're talking about solar cycle 24 now, okay? And so that that's pretty crazy. That's pretty crazy. Um, and the, the weird thing is, and the scary thing is, is they were talking about the increase in cosmic rays, although they weren't mentioned helium, in 2009. The intensities have increased 19% beyond anything they've seen in the last 50 years, said a Caltech uh, astronomer. So, but get, that's 2009. And what happened in 2009? It was solar minimum. Also, what happened in 2009 was the greatest single loss of ice in the history of planet Earth. And it occurred during the solar minimum. That, that was the, the mind-blowing thing. And so when these cosmic rays come in, they collide, they create energy, they ionize, creates energy. And then those, those electrons themselves create energy. But they especially talk about the ratio of helium with respect to protons. And they said something changed. Something changed in cycle 24. So there we are. Okay, uh, this article written in February of last year, 2021, a year ago, is telling you the higher truth was way ahead of everybody. And we're going to do a, a whole episode on methane. The whole methane thing is, I think, is a done deal. And I think we should be planning for extinction right away. Now, when we go to the energy that we're talking about, we were hit over a period of, of, of a long duration, a couple days, with excess electrons and particles coming through. Uh, most particles they talk about as being protons, at least on the instruments that measure protons. But the, the, the thing you see happening before you is you see a lot of energy surrounding Earth. But then you all of a sudden look on this. This is the magnetosphere standoff distance. And... Once upon a time, on the 1st of March, we had a huge in inflow, uh, flux of the magnetosphere. And that magnetosphere went from averaging around 9 Earth radii to 16 Earth radii and then back down to 8 or 9 Earth radii. The distance that our magnetosphere was from Earth. Now... What that does is create a lot of pressure, surface pressure on Now, that surface pressure uh, has been attributed to a lot of things, but it, it, it can create earthquakes. And r right around the same time as that huge flux in our magnetosphere, the Kromadek Islands let go with a 6.6. .6. Of course, that's as we were entering the 90 degree alignment as well with planet X and the sun, but still, when you have that significant of an event in your magnetosphere and an earthquake showing up roughly on the same time, you, you have to wonder if they're related. And if you look back, there's a correlation. About 70% of the time, you have that incredible of a flux of your magnetosphere distance. You also have uh, an increase in amplitude and number of earthquakes. But what caused that flux they say was a geomagnetic storm 
<coughs> but you see, we had one, two, three, four days of storming. Uh, and we know that one tiny Crota hole stream can't just create <coughs> that prolonged event. But we do have a sudden spike on the 5th or the 6th. They say it's this coronal hole that did it. It was earth facing on the 2nd and the 3rd. So, uh, yeah, arrival in two, three days, it could, it could effectively <coughs> create a geomagnetic storm. But, you know, what a weird geomagnetic storm when there's no protons. What a weird geomagnetic storm when you look at under 304 angstroms. You can't even see those coronal holes. And yet, you know, they've, you know, they've identified them. Um, and so... We have to say the coronal holes played a role in the geomagnetic storm, but does not account for what we're seeing. Because, again, as you read the NOAA report, two MeV electron flux right in front of your eyes is high, while the greater than 10 MeV proton flux is at background values. So what what is creating your geomagnetic storms? If it's not the protons, then they're telling you the electron fluxes are high. That don't mess with your magnetosphere, definitely. But they're talking again through the 10th of March. They're expecting the two MeV electron flux to remain high and the protons to remain low. Well, this is why Planet X is up there um, in front of Uranus. Its wind is coming in towards the Earth and it's mixing with the sun's wind. And it's coming in and filtering in in between the spiral arms of that wind. And therefore, it's pulsing in that extra, those extra particles. And those extra particles enhance your geomagnetic storm, especially now as part of those particles are passing through. A portion of them are passing through the corona, getting lit up, ionized, becoming energetic, and releasing a lot more energy. When we talk about the alignments, we always talk about earthquakes with respect to the alignments. But remember, they can also cause solar flares. Again, we're talking earthquakes now. And, and, you know, we're talking wobble. We're talking alignments with Planet X and also Jupiter and the Sun. And Planet X getting higher and higher and higher in the sky. Uh, we're going to expect more of a vertical influence on the motion of Earth, the wobble of Earth. So we're going to see a little more bounce to the wobble. That should make your horizontal plates a little more stressed. But it should also cause more earthquakes in the very north and the very south of planet Earth. And we are seeing the slight increase in our far north earthquakes. In the upper right-hand corner, there's an earthquake way up there uh, off the coast of Greenland, covered up by that drop-down menu. But we see the entire mid-Atlantic ridge. It's not the whole ridge isn't shifting. But again, we're seeing that flavor of a large body alignment where the mid-Atlantic ridge lets go with five pointers at 10 kilometers depth. We do have six pointers down there in the lower left off the coast, Kermadec Islands near the Tonga region. We do have a six pointer also in the Central American uh, nations uh, off, off the coast of Panama, I do believe. So we've had two six pointers already as we enter the alignment. So we're probably looking for a couple more uh, as the alignment finishes. Again, large body alignments affect our, our volcanic zones. You know, you, you take a take a bucket of sand and jiggle it and watch the the sand will subside. So we we see subsidence in the volcanic zones. We see Long Valley Caldera uh, up up there near the coast of excuse me, near the border of Can of California and Nevada. We see the Ridgecrest region. We see the San Andreas region, uh, which is also littered with volcanic stuff. Uh, we see all the volcanic stuff uh, going off. Yellowstone's active. Long Valley's active. Ridge, Ridge Crest has always been active. And people say, well, that's a fault line. That's a fault line. Well, you have to understand that fault is not a tectonic fault. It's a volcanic fault. Volcanic faults are everywhere. There, they, There's faults that we don't even know exist yet. <coughs> As we map them, just looks like a spider web. But we have at the top and the bottom of the Ridgecrest Fault is 
two very significant volcanic regions. Both of those subsided at the same time, and all of a sudden the land in between that connects those subsiding regions lets go. And it let go with the big rich crest quake, and it has not stopped shaking ever since. Salt Lake City still shaking after they had a big quake two years ago. Year and a half ago. <clears throat> Last but not least, you know, people, uh, I challenge your, your, your what you believe. When you mix blue and yellow paint, you get green. But we're talking about actual photons. We're not talking about a substance that absorbs photons. We're talking about the photons themselves. When you mix blue light with yellow light, you get white light. That's what you get. When, when you do take drama and stage, they talk about mixing colored lights to get different colors. It is nothing like mixing paint. Um, and so what creates the blue light are electrons. Electrons changing speed, electrons changing direction will emit blue light. Um, also, when electron jumps off an atom, when an atom gets ionized or attaches to an atom, you also get various forms of photon energy. I also get some forms of visible light. But basically, if you wanted to turn the sun from a yellow sun to a white sun, you would simply add more blue light, more blue light, more energy. So that's why the sun is whiter and hotter. So until next time, be prepared, not scared.